Hi, welcome. Okay, if you're if you want the Sans one, that's that that's next door. So this is called Cheapskate Free and Excellent InfoSec Career Resources. Basically, there's a bunch of free information out there, especially if you're getting started in, in InfoSec or cybersecurity, that I'm just trying to at least give you pointers to. This is available if you go to my LinkedIn page, it's Nathan Chan, CISSP. If you go to LinkedIn, it should be there. You should be able to download it in PDF format. So if you want that, if you want the uh, uh, slides, that's, that's where they're located. So a little bit about me. I've had basically three careers. My first career out of college was in flight simulation, where I did basically software development in both trainers. The first trainer I worked on was a space shuttle down in Houston, Texas, uh, working on the payloads, and then later on moved to military aircraft, and then moved to engineering simulators with Boeing uh, up in Seattle, uh, mainly the uh, 747, not the 737. <laughs> And then from there, I moved over to software testing with the, what I call the Empire, Microsoft, also up in Seattle, and stayed there for a while until I moved here to Southern California, where, uh, as I was telling the story earlier, I was commuting with Jeff here and another friend named Robert, and we were commuting from, we were par carpooling between Pasadena and, and Huntington Beach, and Robert would evangelize to Jeff and me, especially me, security is a great thing to get into, you have software background, you should be able to get into it, you love it. So, he talked, he twisted, he twisted my arm in, into it. So I've worked in defense, commercial software, did work with some small uh, consulting companies in security. I got my CSCP in 2011 and my CEH in 2012. So the agenda is a quick overview of high C information security and C cybersecurity. The next part is the bulk of the bulk of the presentation. There are a lot of links, so that's why I don't, that's why I recommend you get the uh, presentation because the links are there, local uh, meetings to attend, and a little bit about certifications. So this is how I see security. It's maybe a little different if you were at the previous presentation. I see security in these very big, three very big uh, domains, or very big categories, like management, infrastructure, and engineering. These are very, the boundaries between them are very, very fuzzy, and there could be overlap and there could be things that fit in multiple categories. But this is just how I see things to help me keep things organized in my head. So I'm just letting you know this because this may help you too. So management are things involving the organization that are not technical that help keep your organization secure. Things like policy, procedures, personnel, human resources, legal, compliance, very important compliance, training. So these are things that help you help your organization stay secure, but not necessarily technically oriented. I also add to this because it's people oriented. I add physical security, just because it's not it's 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 related to your organization, but not directly related to what your organization does or produces. The second one is infrastructure. This is the stuff that you need technically that helps your organization get work done. Things like your network, your Wi-Fi your cloud, your wireless, any third-party applications, things like Exchange, uh, Outlook, Office, those are that software that you have, but that you need to have, but it's not anything, it's not directly related to, it's not something you, you make or produce yourself. That's the infrastructure. And the third part is, um, the third part is engineering. And that's the stuff that your organization produces, creates for, your, for, for clients, or for or, or something that you create yourself that includes anything that's that's uh, that you outsource. So that would be your website, your applications, your services. These, as I said, these are three very big, broad things. So as an example, there's there can be overlap, like forensics. Forensics is generally a requ legal requirement that you that you that you need to have. Like if you have if you're in a sort of business that 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 they may require some sort of uh, um, investigation. When it's actually executed, it's against your network, your, your data center, your endpoints, and that's an infrastructure thing. And another one, very popular with newcomers, is pen testing. Pen testing is often a compliance issue, managerial. What are you pen testing? Well, one thing you can pen test is getting into the building, social engineering people, managerial, because it's people oriented. If you're pen testing the network, infrastructure, if you're pen testing the application or the website, it's engineering. So it depends on, in engineering, you call it the, con uh, the control volume. It depends on what your boundaries are, your point of view, and what it is that you're doing and how, and how it fits into what your organization are doing. 
So that's so these classifications are very broad and is very dependent on your point of view. So now to get to the free stuff. The there's a great place for a lot of free stuff. It's called it's the National Institute for Standards and Technology, otherwise called NIST. There is a page that you see here of uh, for the Computer Security Resource Center is very extensive. There are tons, of stacks and stacks of information out there. And I, I generally believe that they can be considered authoritative. I want to ask Jeff, Jeff, are these, yes. would this be considered authoritative? Okay, they're considered the authoritative. States. Yeah, at least, in the, at least in the U.S. because it's very government oriented. They have one dis big disadvantage, it's really dry. And it's a pain in the neck to read because it's like, Okay, there could be very interesting stuff and very useful stuff in there, but it's super dry reading. But, it's, but there's tons of information out there for all these different things. And, um, and I w I w with only one exception, I won't be citing this anymore for the rest of this presentation. So this is the exception. There are two introductions uh, to information security, one for a general introduction and a one uh, that's for managers. These are very government oriented because the government organizations have a tendency to have these different positions for, for uh, InfoSec. And these are related, these are, these are tilted in that direction. So they're useful, but it's government related. So just keep that in mind when you, when you see it. Cybersecurity is everyone's job, I think is a very useful document because it talks about the different roles in an organization and how cybersecurity fits within that person's, within each role. I think that's a very useful thing to know. It's very, broad, it's very high level, and of course it could be different for different organizations, but at least as a very high level thing, I think it's a good document to have. It's a good document to look at and be familiar with, especially depending, especially if you're not into, if you're not a technical person, because it talks about things like finance, administration, and so forth, and how each role, what each role should know about cybersecurity, because it is something that everybody in an organization should know. And if you're in an organization which doesn't even practice this, like a small organization, this is worth knowing and saying, and trying to use it as a way of getting everybody to learn what part of cybersecurity should I be interested in. So I like that. The InfoSec Handbook is published by APRESS. Now, APRESS publishes a ton of books. APRESS Open is a is a subset of books that they make freely available to you in an EPUB e or PDF format. So those are all, for, anything under A Press Open is free. So they have one called the InfoSec Handbook. People may differ on, on its usefulness, but it's, I think, better, easier reading than in this stuff. And it's also a bit more comprehensive. It covers more, covers more uh, information. There's another book called, in A Press Open, just a side note, called Rethinking the Internet of Things. Also, A Press Open. I think it, it, it was uh, under consideration for some awards, but just something to keep in mind. Uh, Navigating the Digital Age was created by uh, the stock market people and Cisco, and it keeps. Uh, it's more again. It's a high-level thing, mainly written for the C-suite people, just for that make, make them know, keep have them understand what things they should keep in mind concerning cybersecurity. So it talks in, in the C in the C suite lang in the C suite language. The first edition is freely available at the link. The second one requires a sign up. Second edition requires a sign up. Um, another site that's very useful with a lot of information is the Center for Internet Security, and then the CISO's Guide for Bolstering Cybersecurity Posture is basically a collection of their blogs. Uh, it does require a sign up, but it's still free. And Defender's Dilemma, RAND is another place where, it's, where tons of free information, uh, uh, and, but RAND covers many, many, many different topics. So uh, they do have one called the Defender's Dilemma. Again, talks about at a high level what cybersecurity issues um, that CISOs are worried about and some of the issues that they have to, some issues that they, they have to deal with. Okay, now we get into the management stuff. So, Compliance is a very broad topic because there are many, many different things to be compliant to. Um, there are two lists that I, that I saw on the internet that I kind of liked from, from Telos and one from TDCI. One in particular that, I've, that I see a lot is PCI DSS. That's basically anything involving a credit card. And the credit card people got together and said, here's a standard that we would like all our, anybody who creates a credit card to follow. And they make it, it it's pretty extensive. Um, it's pretty extensive, but it could also be interpreted in many different ways. 
GDPR, which is privacy, is a slightly different thing, is a European uh, privacy regulation. That's a site where there's a lot of information, but the problem is it's very, because it's, it involves privacy, it's a law, it's very broad, so I don't know exactly where to look to look for some of these things. One thing that you have, that you have to understand, though, is compliance is, is gives you a guideline to keep you secure, but because you're compliant doesn't mean you're secure. Target was PCI compliant, and it still didn't, it still didn't help them. It's European Union. So one thing I wonder about, I don't know the answer to this question, does it count to, does Britain count? <laughs> if, Brexit, if Brexit goes through, are they free, are they, you know, are, do, they don't, do they not have to follow it? Now they could say, well, if you have businesses in the EU, yes, you still have to follow it. And you, businesses in the US have things in the EU, so they have to be aware of it to see how it affects their business. Yeah, see, I mean, so, so it, it's, it's uh, you know, that's, it's just, we know about it because there are very, there are very few organizations and businesses that are limited to a single country. And many of them do something with the EU. And the consequences, I, that's why you, being aware of it's a good thing. If you're in an organization, I hope that they're aware of it and know how it affects your organization directly. And we also have the CCPA, which is the California version of this, and there are, it's still, this, they're still being amended even now. So I, this is just a, a thing that I saw, you know, back in the 20th. It's still being amended before, before, before they actually say, okay, this is what the Privacy Act says. And related to privacy is an organization called the IEPP, the, in, uh, or, uh, the Association for Privacy Professionals. There's some free material there. Free mem the paid membership is required for full access. There, it's basically, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, about the IEPP a little later, but there's there is free material at the IEPP, just not all of it. And then uh, DHS has a risk management primer for CEOs, again at a high enough level. There's a cybersecurity framework at NIST, which entails many of their different documents, and C uh, CMU. Uh, the uh, software engineering institute has a blog had a blog on risk management that they risk management that they wrote, that they wrote about a year ago. So the risk is another very broad thing. So, uh, something that helps me to understand how security fits in a business is I think of security as part of risk because it's basically, you know, I have five bucks, I need to protect something. What do I with my five dollars? What is the thing I in my in my organization I should protect? What's the most important thing? Is it intellectual property? Is it people's data? Is it you know? So I need to make a decision. I have to know what risk I'm taking, where I should put my dollars to, and knowing that it's risk helps me understand what should I, where should I be putting all my, where should I be putting my resources? I can't protect everything. That's impossible. And I shouldn't spend two million dollars to protect a million dollars. That's stupid. So I need to understand what I should be protecting in a business and in an organization. And that goes with any organization. Training and awareness. This is more for uh, maybe workers who are looking to help their people become aware of what is, of, of, again, free resources, of what they could, videos they could watch to see, to, that discuss being uh, cyber aware. Just simple things about being careful to don't click on certain links, things like that. And these are, these are checklists. These are just more self-assessment things. These are, again, very high level. They can be very detailed, so it, it may depend on, again, your organization or what it is you're trying to protect. But I, I found these. I thought, okay, this may be, be, may be useful to a few people, at least to have, them, have you look at it and say, okay, here's the things I need to keep in mind when I try to assess myself. But of course, you need to adapt it to your organization. Okay, the infrastructure. This is, the infrastructure again is your network and anything that you need in your organization to get your work done. A great source is the Center for Internet Security. Their most famous product is the 20 controls. Version 7.1 is their latest version. You do require sign up in order to download it. SANS has posters of the CIS controls, which are free. And they hit, and they kind of link the po they kind of link the controls to other external things like you can use this to help you with this control and so forth, and then the other two are from are to help you if you have a website, 
if you have your server side, your TLS, how to protect, what you should do to protect your website. And they give suggestions, both of the, the OWASP cheat sheet and the Mozilla server side give you suggestions. So here are the, here are the, um, uh, here are the encryption that you should use and so forth. And they're very helpful because they, especially for Mozilla, they say if you have a new site, here's what you should use. You have an, if you're talking to older computers, here's what you should use. If you're just getting started or you have a, a, a you know, modern uh, uh, site, here's what you should use. So they, they give you some good suggestions, well thought out suggestions over how you should set up your, your, your web server. Better Crypto used to be a PDF. It's basically not just a document on the internet. Uh, again, written by a few people who are concerned about crypto and they talk about how to do crypto in di using different, uh, di different uh, front ends. I'm sorry, using different back ends. Nardac has a free crypto tool for IIS that you can freely download. Again, it goes into the different encryptions and things like that and how you, how you can set up your own, uh, if you have your own website. OpenSSH. Is a, is a secure shell that's uh, openly available to everybody because it's a, it, it's a free download. And then Mozilla again gives recommendations over how best to configure it so that it's, so keep it as secure as possible because there are different, many different encryption algorithms. Some are better than others. Some are more applicable than others. And Mozilla gives suggestions on those. And the Cloud Security Alliance gives a very thick document on um, security guidance for, for the cloud. In this version four, it's the, it's the latest version they have. All is, most of this is free. The CSA also has a cloud matrix to help you uh, to ask questions and to give you kind of a guidance related to the document I saw uh, that I just showed you before. Cyber kill chain. Um, I'm not completely well versed in this, but the cyber kill chain is a way of seeing how attackers attack. Uh, websites and attack organizations, and it goes through a list of things that they will do in an order, in a, in a certain order. Lockheed Martin has one, MITRE has one, and it basically the, the 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 point is to understand different ways attackers can get to you, and if you can get the get the attacker at this point, then anything over, then anything afterwards should be relatively dealt with. That's what the kill chain is. And if you want to do pen testing, there's a there's a, there's an actual standard out there. That gives, uh, that gives, again, guidelines on how to do a pen test, how best to do a pen test. Incident response. An, in an incident response is basically, what do I do when I get hacked? What do I do when something happens in my, in, in my system and I found out that uh, some, something's happened? So th these are two, uh, again, guidelines, one from CMU and uh, both from CMU about creating a response team. There's a, several documents and videos about that, and there's a handbook that was written a while ago, uh, but the concepts of incident response haven't really changed a whole lot. And continuing further, CREST is, the British, is, a, is a British organization that, also, that, does, that concerns itself with cyber, and there is a PDF document for that. And the DOJ is, is a short document that basically talks about if I'm a victim, of an attack, or I've lost data, what should I do next? It, made, it, it discusses things concerning a law, who do you should, you should contact out externally. And in an organization, hopefully they, you know that already, but uh, if you've been personally been attacked, this is something that might be useful to you. Now we're in engineering. This development life cycle is basically when you create software, you have a certain sequence of things. You have, you have requirements, you have, you have design, you have construction, you have testing, you have deployment, you have maintenance, and it keeps going in a cycle around and around. And, for, and to do secure software, the cycle is basically is, is similar, but security is not, part, is not part of the picture. Here are two um, models of how to do software, of how to do the whole cycle. OpenSAM is from OWASP. Building Security In is, is a document that talks about how companies practice it and tells here are the practices that most companies seem to be doing. It keeps getting updated. The version 9 is freely available. Version 10, which is recent, requires a sign up. There's, there can be a mapping between the two, but it's basically better to choose one model and stick with it. But you can try to do a mapping. I've never tried to do a mapping between the two. 
Microsoft also has their own version of a, of a life cycle. And there's a free book that was published in 2006 that they've made available over in the past couple of years about Microsoft security development life cycle. CMI, uh, the CMU SCI also did a, a capability maturity model. It's really, really detailed, <laughs> almost painfully detailed. And then Rugged is a uh, site that talks about keeping uh, not just the, S the SDLC, but also just your whole or keeping your whole organization rugged in that it can, it can create software, uh, software easily. And some, it, it led a little bit to a DevSecOps. It's an early version of it. Training, and some of this may be applicable if you were at, uh, if you were at Jim Manico's thing earlier today. Um, there is the OWASP technical uh, tutorial series, safe code training, two sets of slides from open security training. They have, these are slides for classes that these guys teach, but they make the slides freely available to you. So these are things that you can at least look at for, for, uh, uh, for video or for slides just to get an idea of what's entailed in, uh, in secure coding. But secure coding is, a, is, is another big topic and it depends on, you have Secure coding depends on, on what language you're using too. So OWASP, tons of material on secure coding. I'm not even going to go to what they have. There's just so much out there. I'm pointing to the different projects. And then there are a bunch of cheat. There's also OWASP cheat sheets that also talks a lot about these things. And MITRE talks, MITRE Corporation, uh, sponsors two sites, one called the Weakness Enumeration and the other called Vulnerabilities and Exposures. And I just had to ask Jeff earlier today about the difference between the two. A weakness is something like cross-site scripting. That's a weakness. A vulnerability would be version X of Windows with running this version of Mozilla will have this, will have this cross-site scripting problem. Is that a good way to say it, Jeff? So vulnerabilities and exposures are, would be specific to products. Weaknesses are more, are more general. But MITRE Corporation sponsors both, uh, sponsors both of them. There are other sources. i just give you a few here. IEEE has a design document called Avoiding the Top 10 Security Flaws. It's basically uh, a, in, in text. It doesn't give you specific things for languages. It gives you a whole more of a design. Here's how you design it type thing. Here are the things to keep in mind when you design it. SANS has a SWAT checklist, which, is, uh, which, which can break, uh, uh, break down things into smaller pieces as you, as you go down their checklist. And again, uh, the SCI has top 10 secure coding practices, similar to this one, except again, it's in, it's in text, doesn't, it's, not, it's language independent. CWE SANS has the top 25 most dangerous software errors uh, in, in, in some detail. SMU, uh, the CI cert Secure Coding Standards, they have, uh, they have an active JIRA page that talks about, uh, th that they keep updating and you can contribute to, that talks about secure coding for C, C++, Java, Perl, Android, they say Android, um, for, they, ha they have different, they have guidelines and recommendations on secure coding in those, in those languages at this site. Mozilla has secure coding guidelines for web, and Microsoft has secure coding guidelines for .NET. So there are many different standards that are out there concerning, uh, concerning uh, coding. And a lot of, I'm sure there are companies out there with their static tool analysis take some of these and, make, and, and automate, it, automate it for you. And there's another organization, Institute for Secure and Open Methodologies. They have a, secure, a security testing manual. It's kind of like similar to the OWASP one. Same, same concept, just it's their own version of it. Okay, general subjects. These are more, these are broader, not necessarily all security related, but some of them are. Ross Anderson is a professor at, I think at Oxford, he has a book called Security Engineering. In the second edition is 2008. He's currently working on the third edition. And it is 900 pages, but it's an overview because he talks about many different aspects of security of which many are not software related. But it's a good, it's, it's a good overview because he talks about all the di different issues like tamper-proof, things like that, um, even biometrics, all these different 
all these different uh, uh, topics that are about security. Peter Gutman from New Zealand has a technical document uh, that, that's in draft, that was in draft form in 2014 about also about engineering security. But he's more, he, he's, he's, he's more down in the weeds, maybe, maybe more infrastructure oriented like your network and things like that. The third document underneath is called the, known as the SWEBOC, the Software Body Engineering of Software Engineering Body of Knowledge. It is not a security document, but it's also it's also standard 19759. It was an attempt, it's an attempt to try to summarize software engineering into a single document. Some would say it's very waterfall related, but some would also try to say that well, at least you can try to at least squeeze out um, squeeze out. Uh, concepts in Agile too, but it is available and it, is, it happens to be, a, it, I did not know this until recently while I was putting this together that it's, that's also an ISO standard. Charles Kozyorok wrote a book called the TCP IP Guide. It was done by No Starch Press, it was published by No Starch Press, but he kept updating it and he does have it made it available for free on the internet. So when I have questions on TCP IP, I actually go there. And, and, and look them and look them up. He, he and he tries, to, especially if I don't understand things in uh, networking. He has these reasonable explanations for it, and it's pretty it's pretty extensive. If you were to print it out, it'd be ridiculously thick. The the second link about a handbook of applied cryptography by CRC is very 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 math oriented. I don't even understand it. I look at it and there's symbols and symbols and symbols and full of symbols, and I just I put it there in case you're mathematically inclined and want to and want to try to tackle it. The Mel and Baker one helped me a lot when I was studying for the CISSP test. It helped me understand the concepts of cryptography, and I used. I found for me it was very very useful. So I put it there because I found it. I found it very useful. It was much more much simpler than reading this. This one I couldn't even comprehend, but it is free and it is out there. The rest of these are taxonomies on software errors, security risks, incident classifications, because in, I think keeping things organized is very helpful. It just keeps, keeps, it keeps things from getting too messy and too, getting too chaotic. So these are just different ways of organizing different things that, are, that, that have been made available. And my last NIST, my last NIST uh, reference, they have a glossary of terms that's online for version three. And version two has um, is, is is available, but it's con it's considered withdrawn. But they have terms there on any th on on any term on on uh, cyber that you that you could possibly want to ask for. Okay, the local meetings are um, these are the different meetings that you have that you can attend. The CSA first week of the month, Osaka second uh, second Tuesday, except this month, this meeting this coming Tuesday. ISSA, OWASP, these are the local meetings. I realize I went out of, I'm out of time. The HCCIA, which is more criminal, forensics, high technology, criminal investigation, and other ones in the area. Isaka, ISSA, OWASP, San Fernando Inland Empire. I didn't, I didn't address uh, uh, San Diego. And then about certifications, basically you demonstrate you have a certain knowledge base. If you are new to this, I think CompTIA are good. CompTIA certs are good. Professor Messer has free videos for A+, Network+, and Security+, and maybe a Microsoft one, and they're freely available to look at on the internet. And they're, they're not short. They're pretty long. And they have a certification roadmap. And one that they don't, that the program does not talk about are offensive security pen tests. The OSCP, I think, is a very good one if you're interested in pen testing. And another one, the privacy professionals, they have three different ones involving law, manager, managerial, and technical certifications at IAPP. These, these are not in the CompTIA roadmap. And these are different lists of top paying certifications. Education, these are, these are free classes that you get. Cyberary is a really good one. They have a lot of classes there. Some more here. And then the last one is there's, if you're into hacking, there's Kali, as I hope a lot of you know about. You can install it on a virtual machine and VirtualBox, and there are bunches of vulnerable targets you can use to help you 
learn how to hack. And it is, I'm, I'm over. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And again, Nathan Chan, CIP, CEH, the, the presentation's there. And if you want to connect, tell me how we met. <laughs>